Finish their vacation yet? <laughs> so, if you had a good long weekend, good. Actually, I didn't have one very good. I'm suffering from cold, fever, flu for the last couple of days. Uh, anyway, uh, let's start. Uh, our today's topic is determination of sample size. A review of statistical theory. So if I just give you a little background, you know, in last two weeks, what we have learned are, just last two, last week we learned how we can write down a questionnaire, the guidelines of writing a questionnaire. The last week we learned about different sampling techniques. So. Once you are done with your questionnaire, then once you are decided about your sampling technique, that means which sampling technique you are going to use, a probability technique or non-probability sampling technique, 
The next question is, what should be your sample size? That means if you have a target population, then which subsample of your population should be sulfate? Okay, so that's that's one of our agenda today, and we will also review uh, some statistical knowledge. I think most of you have these preliminary ideas like uh, measures of central <coughs> tendencies, measures of dispersion, then central limit theorem, some uh, statistical theory. We will be reviewing. So this is chapter seven of our textbook. Formally, our learning objectives are, first of all, we will start with discussing some statistical terminology that we will be using throughout this chapter. Then we will be discussing some techniques or ways of organizing or summarizing data. So we will be talking about uh, percentage distribution, frequency distribution, probability distribution. These are actually not in true sense, some statistical technique, these are actually the way of summarizing or organizing data. We will uh, differentiate between sample, sampling, population, and sample distribution. We will learn the basic idea of central limit theorem. We will see what's the difference between point estimates and confidence interval estimates when we try to make an inference from the sample about the population. And last of all, we will be discussing some issues that we should be considering while we determine our sample size. So first of all, as I said that we will be uh, learning some terminologies, descriptive statistics. So. Whenever we start with a data set, that means if you have some data in numeric terms, the first thing we do is a descriptive analysis. Okay? So first thing we do is we try to find out some descriptive statistics. Okay? So what is the objective of this descriptive analysis or descriptive statistics? By this descriptive analysis or descriptive statistics, we will try to summarize or try to explain our data. Okay. So keep it in mind, we are not explaining our research issues or we are not explaining our research objective. When we are doing a descriptive analysis or descriptive statistics, we are basically trying to summarize our data or try to describe our data. For example, if you have, say, that we have 50 students in this class, and if you are given assessment one's mark for all these 50 students, okay? Assessment one's marks for all these 50 students. If this data is given to you, and if you are asked to find out some descriptive statistics, what you will be looking at. Like, how will you be explaining this data by looking into some statistics probably? <coughs> what you will be looking at? 50 marks. 50 students, 50 marks, each out of 100. Okay? Now, how will you describe this data? No idea? You want to say anything? No? Well, whenever uh, like I release marks of uh, any assessment, the first point you ask commonly, well, uh, what's the average? What's the average marks? What's the highest mark? What's the lowest mark? So uh, how many got HDs? What are these? These are descriptive statistics. Because when you have a certain data set, you look at what's the average, what's the highest observation, what's the lowest observation, uh, what's the difference between highest, lowest observation, how many, how many students, or what's the proportion of students got HDs, what's the proportion of students failed. These are descriptive statistics. Yeah? So 
We will be learning more about descriptive statistics in the next class. So when we are uh, looking at descriptive statistics, we basically describe our data. Inferential statistics, this is a terminology we use uh, very frequently, that we are doing some inferential statistics. Typically in business research, we, we do these inferential statistics. So what it actually is, we try to make an inference about our population from our sample, okay? That means we analyze our sample, make an inference, and we generalize this inference for our population. That's called inferential statistics. That means we are not doing a census. We are not analyzing our population. We are analyzing our sample, but making an inference about our population. That's, that's called inference of statistics. Then sample statistics and population parameters, these are simple. If you estimate some parameters, or if you make some estimation about your sample, that's what we call sample statistics. That means if you generate some statistics from your sample, that's called sample statistics. If you generate some parameters from your population, we call them population parameters. That means you are dealing with sample, you generate sample statistics. If you're dealing with population, you generate population statistics or population parameters. In your textbook, you might have noticed that some notations are used throughout the textbook. Some notations are used. Uh, remember that when you see some lowercase Greek letters, for example, alpha, mu, beta, some these are lowercase Greek letters. If you see these notations, those actually indicate population parameters. However, if you see uppercase English letters denoting something throughout your textbook, uppercase English letters, those actually indicate sample parameters. Okay? So, uh, whenever you look at these notations, keep this in mind. The second point that we will be discussing today, as I said, that the way of uh, summarizing or organizing data. So once we have the data, <coughs> the first thing, as I said, that we need to organize or summarize data. Hmm? So what's the meaning of organizing or summarizing? Actually, we, we need to organize or we need to summarize or we need to present our data in such a way so that we get some useful information. If you have like hundreds of thousands of numeric observations, you cannot get anything meaningful from them. That's why you go for organizing or summarizing data so that we can extract some information. Uh, the first step of this summarizing or making data usable is to do some frequency distribution, percentage distribution, and probability distribution. All of you are familiar with this. First of all is frequency distribution. That means we may present our data in a frequency distribution. What's that? When we make a frequency distribution, we actually make a table. We make a table where we show different numbers, different numbers that represent the frequency of occurring a particular observation, or frequency of appearing a particular observation. Okay, for example, your variable, one of your variables is gender. Hmm? Gender, and in this column, you have male, female, male, female, male, female and you code them male one, female two. So in this entire column, what you will have? One, two, one, two, one, two, one, two. Now, if you make a frequency distribution, what you will actually do is, how many times one appears in the column? How many times two appears in the column? So if you have 100 observation, and you make a frequency distribution, and you write that male is 50 and female is 50, it means that in your total number of observations, like 100, 50 times 
one, FAS1 and 50 times FAS2. Okay, so in this frequency distribution, if we do it for a particular variable or for a particular column, we will see how we can do that in using Excel in our workshop session. So we will represent our entire column or our entire data by some numbers, and each number will present the frequency of appearing a particular observation. Is this point clear? Okay. Now, percentage distribution is very similar. In frequency distribution, as we are say, showing an absolute number, how many times an observation is coming. But in percentage distribution, we do not show absolute number, we show percentage, I mean proportion. Proportion of times one observation is appearing in the column. Hmm? Let's say that you have a variable income level. Income level, and you have five income level groups. Hmm? Five income level groups, one, two, three, four, five. Now, if you make a percentage distribution, you will actually show how many of your, what's the proportion of your respondent belongs to income group one? What's the proportion of your respondents belong to income groups two? What's the proportion of your respondent belong to income group three? And so on. So in percentage distribution, you will summarize your data in percentage form. And probability distribution will simply show a long run probability of occurring a particular event or occurring a particular observation. If these three definitions are clear, then let's see some examples one by one for each of these. So look at this example first. It was a survey of 3,120 people. And they were asked that what amount of deposit they hold in a financial institution. So there were five groups. You can see under $3,000, 3000 to 5 3000 to 5900, 6000 to 8999, 9000 to 11999, 12000 and more. So these are the five different groups and each respondent were asked that which group he or she belongs. Okay. Now you can see that 499 respondents says that they have a deposit of under $3000. 530 respondents say that their deposit is from 3,000 to 5,999. 562 respondents say that they are deposited between 6,000 to 8,999 in this way. Okay. So what are these numbers? These 499, 530, 562, 718, and 811. What is this number? This number actually presenting how many times a particular observation is appearing in the column. Okay, so since you have five groups here, you need to put one numeric number, one numeric value for each of this group, right? One, two, three, four, five, for example. Now, what, if you put one, two, three, four, five, it means that 499 times one comes in, the, in all of the observations. If 3,000 to 5,999 is coded as two, then this two appears 530 times. Are you with me? So this is frequency distribution. How many times an observation appears in your data set? Now, instead of the numbers like 500 and something or 400 and something, if we expressed it in percentage form, how does it look like? So here we, we express it in percentage form. You can see 16%, 17%, 18%, 23%, 26%. What are this percentage? Can anyone tell me? For example, if I say 16%, what does it indicate? Sixteen hmm? percent. Number of uh, those that responded for category one divided by the total number of respondents. Okay, sixteen percent is the proportion of respondents. Proportion of respondents who have a deposit of under three thousand, right? 
That means in the total number of respondents, 16% of them have a deposit of under 3,000. How did you get this 16%? Can anyone tell me? How did you get this 16%? If you compare it with our previous slide, this one, like 499, 530, 562, 18, and 811. Now, how did, you, how did you get this 16, 17, 18? How did you get this percentage? Isn't it just by addition? Like, 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 like. Right. Each, each number of observation, I mean, each frequencies have been divided by the total number. Hmm? For example, under 3,000, uh, how many people have a deposit under 3,000? There were 499, and total observation is 3,120. So if we divide 499 by uh, 3,120, we got this percentage. So this is percentage distribution, and this is probability distribution. So what a probability distribution is, as I told you earlier, that probability distribution tells you a probability of occurring a particular event, or probability of occurring a particular observation. Okay. Now, look, in this case, under 3,000 is 0.16. From 3,000 to 5,999 uh, 5, is 0.17, like this. So what this, when I say probability is 0.16, what I want to mean, actually? How many respondents we have? 3,120, OK? Now, if we randomly pick one of our respondents from 3,120 respondents, if we randomly pick one res respondent, what's the probability that the respondent will belong to category 1? That is 16%. Do you get my point? Again, I said, we have 3,120 respondents. If we randomly pick up one respondent, okay, anyone from this entire sample, what's the probability that this respondent will belong to deposit group one? That is 16%. Okay? Now, if I ask that, what's the probability that the respondent will have an a deposit level of 12,000 or more? That is 26%. Okay? So that's probability distribution. So, by preparing this, this type of frequency distribution, uh, percentage distribution, and probability distribution, we summarize, uh, summarize or categorize our data. The next topic we discuss is uh, measures of central tendency. I think all of you have read them in, uh, in your elementary statistics course in, in some stage of your uh, education life. Uh, any idea what we mean by central tendency? Very basic statistics. Central tendency. No one? Don't you say anything? Something like an average? Okay. Average is a measure, measure of central tendency. Yes, I, I'm just uh, looking at like what's the general idea when we say central tendency? What do we mean by that? Yes. Increase or decrease. Mm. Okay. Generally, generally, a data set shows the characteristics of central tendency. Okay. Any data set typically has these characteristics. There is a central tendency. So that's what I'm asking that what we mean by this. Look, when, whenever you have a data set, what we are interested in is we are interested to find the center of the data. Hmm? We are interested to find center of the data. Why? 
Why we are interested at the center of the data? Because data, numeric data or numeric observations have a tendency to cluster or move or hover around the center. Hmm. Like as I was telling you a few moments back that when an assessment marks is released, uh, the typically, typically uh, one uh, question I uh, face that what's the average? Okay. Now look, you have a, you have one score, maybe like out of hundred, maybe 60, 70, 80, 90. Why you want to know average? Why people want to know average? Hmm? No idea? You have a score, but if, if you are still interested to know average, why? <coughs> what information it gives you? Okay, you are higher or below the average. What's the what's the benefit of knowing that? <coughs> no idea. I think it's a good measure to maybe take <coughs> our position, for example, in the exam. Sometimes if I study really hard, but I mm -hmm. get no mark, and then I find myself over the average. Okay, so you are saying that you you uh, understand your position. How? Like you know that your score is 70, but average is 60. So what is your position? Better than average. Better than average. OK. So you become happy. Why? To compare with the, to compare with, the, I don't know how to say, but um, most, not like most, but other students are better. I get a better result. You get the better result compared to most of the students that you want to say, right? Mm -hmm. that, that's actually the, the point I am looking at. We are interested about average because average is something <coughs> that majority of the students score. Yes or no? That's, a, that's called central tendency. That's called central tendency. What? As I'm saying that, you have a particular score, but you like to compare your score with an average. Why? Because you know, if average is, for example, 60, it means that most of the students have a mark around 60. That's why it is average. Yes or no? So that is central tendency. That means when we have a data, we try to find out what is the center of the data. For example, average. We try to find out the center of the data because once we understand that this is the center of the data, we get another information that majority of the data, majority of the observation must be close to the center. Okay, that's called central tendency. Individual observations have a tendency to move around the center. Hmm? Sort of, sort of. When you have any data set and you get an average, average is calculated in such a way that definitely most of the observation is close to that. That's why it's average. Otherwise, average would have been something different. Okay? But average is not the only measure of the center of the data. Two other measures are, you can say, median and mood. Okay? So average that we call mean. Hmm? Mean is uh, the arithmetic mean. I will show you very shortly how do we calculate it. I, I understand that all of you know how to do that. Uh, so mean is the arithmetic average. That's the first measure of center tendency. The second one is median. Do you understand what is what median is? Yes. Yeah. 
Do you have any idea? Hmm? Median is called the midpoint of the data. Okay, midpoint of the data. So ideally, ideally, when you have a median value of your data, it means that half of the observation should be below the median and half of the observation should be above the median when you calculate a median of your data. And the mood. Any idea what mood is? Hmm? The observation that comes most often. The observation that is most frequently occurring in the data set. That is called mood. Hmm? So mean, once again mean, is the arithmetic average. Median is the midpoint of data. And mood is a observation that comes most frequently. Hmm? Median? Mean is arithmetic average. OK. Now, uh, I'm saying that, OK, we have three measures of center tendency, mean, median, mood. Now, definitely a question can come uh, that why we have these three different measures. We have three different measures of center tendency because different measures are suitable in different circumstances. Uh, different measures are suitable in different situations, uh, different data sets. Okay. <laughs> Let's say that you have two persons. One person's average income is 100,000. Try to understand my example. Two persons. One one's income is one hundred thousand. Others' income is one million yearly income. Okay, one hundred thousand and one million. So, what will be the average income? One hundred thousand and one million. Average income of these two people. Hmm? Five? Five fifty thousand. Okay. Now look. Two persons, one has an income of one hundred thousand, other has one million, and if you say that average income of you is five fifty thousand, right? Now the person, both of them will be unhappy, I think. Yes or no? Because the person who has an income of one hundred thousand you also well. I belong to an average income group of 550,000. And the person who has an income of 1 million, he or she will also be unhappy. He'll say, well, why do I belong to an average income group of only 550,000 where, where I have an income of 1 million? That's the problem of arithmetic average. What's the problem? Do you understand what's the problem in this example? Hmm? You have two extreme values, right? 100,000 and 1 million. Now, when you calculate average, average or mean is too much affected by the extreme values, extreme numbers, extreme observations. Okay. So, when your data set have some extreme observations, then mean is not a good measure of central tendency. Then we should look at median. Why? Because median, as I told you, that median is the midpoint of the data. Okay? Ideally, it is the midpoint of the data. So half of the data will be below the median and half of the data will be above the median. Now, half of the data is below the median. It doesn't matter how below it is. And half of the data is above the median, so it doesn't matter how above it is. It will pick up the midpoint. OK. So when you have a data set where extreme observations are there, median is a better measure compared to mean. But if you have a homogeneous data, not too many extreme observations, then mean is a good measure. Is it OK? So it's just a simple example that 
why you have different measures of central tendency because that depends on the nature of your delta, which one you use. Just a very simple example. All of you know how to calculate average, but still uh, I show you. Uh, you have eight cells, uh, eight cells person, and each of them receives some cells calls. For example, Mike, Patty, Billy, Bob, John, Frank, Chuck, and Samantha. And they receive different number of cells calls, like 4, 3, 2, 5, 3, 3, 1, and 5. So some of these cells calls are 26, and number of cells persons are 8. So what we generally do is we denote the variable by a certain Later, for example, in this case, we denote it as x. Like if, you, if your variable is number of calls, you denote it by x, then x1, x2, x3, up to x8. So you have eight observations, you can see, eight observations. And if you sum all these observations, so that 4, 3, 2, 5, 3, 3, 1, 5, the sum of these observations is 26, and the number of observations is 8. So if you divide 26 by 8, you can see numerator is sum of x and denominator is the number of observations. So as 26 is divided by 8, you get 3.25. This is your arithmetic average. OK? This is also the formula as how do you calculate average. Now, measures of dispersion. So, so far we talked about measures of central tendency mean, median, mood. Now, measures of dispersion. Anyone has any idea? Measures of dispersion. OK. Um, so far. We are talking about central tendency, measures of central tendency, for example, arithmetic average. Now, that's one information we get about our data, that what is the center of the data. Now, these measures of dispersion, these are some other measures. By looking at these measures of dispersion, what we'll, we will know is how dispersed or how spread the data set is. Hmm? How dispersed or how spread the data set it means that how the individual observations are away or spread from the center of the data. Hmm? Let, me, let me show you a simple example. Let's say, first of all, you have you have one data set where you have three observations, three, three, and three. So if we calculate average, average is generally denoted by generally denoted by x bar. So what's the average here? Three. Am I right? Average is three. Now, if we have another data set, for example, 2, 3, and 4. So what's the average for the second data set? Hmm? It's still 3, right? OK. Now, this is still 3. Now, the first data set observations are 3, 3, 3, average is 3. In the second case, it's 2, 3, 4, and average is also 3. So here comes the role of measures of dispersion. 
as I said, the measures of distortion actually look at how spread the data is. Okay, how individual observations are away from the center of the data. So, which data set you think has higher dispersion? Hmm? Second one, which one? I mean, two, three, four. That has that has a higher dispersion. First one, lower dispersion because it has three, three, three. Okay, you are right. So that's actually the role of measures of dispersion. So, as there are different measures of central tendency, there are different measures for dispersion as well. First of all is range. Range is one measure that gives us an idea that how dispersed or how spread the data is. How do we calculate range? Range is the difference between the largest and the smallest observation. Okay? That means if you have a data set, if you have a data set, if you take the maximum number and the minimum number, I mean the largest number and the smallest number, and if you take the difference, that is called range. And that gives you an idea that how spread the data set is. Okay? And the second one is standard deviation. A standard deviation measures the average deviation, average deviation of individual observations from the mean value. Once again, standard deviation measures the average deviation. That means it actually calculates how each observation is deviated from the mean and then calculates this average deviation. Okay, so that is that is a standard deviation. So look how we calculate standard deviation. Uh, um, also, also first of all, look at these examples. Sales level for two products, so identical average sales. Unit, units product A and unit products product B. So these are the different quantity of cells uh, over the months for two product, product A and product B. Look, for product A, monthly sales are like 196, 198, 199, 200, 201, and 202, and average is 200. For product B, look at the monthly cells, 150, 160, 176, 181, 192, 200, 201, 2, 13, 24, 40, 61, average is still 200, okay? So for both of these cells delta, we see that average is say 200. But do you think that this partial or the spread of the data is safe? Hmm? The spread of the data is not safe. Where the spread of the data is higher? For product B, the spread of the data is higher, okay? So that's actually, we look at our loop with our naked eye and we say that, okay, the product uh, B's cells is more dispersed. We can graphically present it or we can mathematically calculate that. So if we graphically present this, uh, this low dispersion and high dispersion data set looks like this. You can see that in the vertical axis, if you show frequency and in the horizontal axis, if you show the value of variances, then sorry, value or variable, then the low dispersion data, those will be concentrated, okay? Whereas high dispersion data set, these dot points that is representing the frequency and the value, that will be more dispersed, okay? So that is the graphical representation. Now, we can calculate standard deviation. This is what I already discussed. The standard deviation is the average deviation. This is the formula we use to calculate measures of dispersion. Look at the look at the formula carefully. First of all, we calculate <coughs> variance. Then, as we take a square root of variance, we get standard deviation. So, look at the equation below. So, how do we get standard deviation? This is x i minus x bar. Okay. So, you understand what x bar is? Hmm? This one, x bar is the average. I mean, x then a, a sign at the top. That's called x bar. So x i minus x bar, it means the, the deviation of individual observation from the mean value. Then we square it, okay? Square it, 
n we sum them up, then we divide it by n minus 1, and finally we square root it. That is standard deviation. As I said, that it is the average deviation of individual observations from the mean value. Now let's see let's see a calculation using this formula. You can remember we had eight salespeople and each salespeople had each sales, each salesperson had a particular number of sales calls. And we already calculated average that was 3.25. Can you remember? That was our average, 3.25. And this 4325 these are the different number of sales calls each uh, salesperson were receiving. So first of all, what we need to do is we need to get the deviations, deviations of individual observation from mean value. So look what we are doing. 4 minus 3.25, 3 minus 3.25, 2 minus 3.25. So in each case, this 3.25 is the mean value. Okay? 3.25 is the mean value. And we are deducting this 3.25 from each observation. So that's the deviation of individual observation from mean value. Then we are squaring them. Again, okay? you can see x minus x bar square, the extreme right column. We are squaring them, and finally we are summing them up. So once we sum them up, we get 13.5. And if we divide this 13.5 by n minus 1, and we square root that, we get the standard deviation. And the standard deviation here is 1.38. So as I already have said, that standard deviation is the average deviation of individual observation from mean value. So it is here, this uh, standard deviation is 1.38. We need to understand that <coughs> since it's a sort of ratio, because you can see we have a numerator and we have a denominator. So we get uh, a ratio 1.38. That's why this number itself itself is not very much meaningful because if a standard deviation is 1.38 or 2.38 or something, we cannot say that whether standard deviation is higher or a standard deviation is lower. Do you get my point? That means here you can see that standard deviation is 1.38. So if you ask me that, well, is this standard deviation is higher? That means if the data is very much spread, we cannot say. Because the number itself is not very meaningful. However, if we have standard deviations of different variables or different data set, we can compare them and we can say that which variable is more dispersed or more spread relative to other variables. Do you understand my point? That means if this is the standard deviation, that means 1.38, this is the standard deviation of one variable, and if we have another variable which has a standard deviation of two, we can say that standard deviation of that variable is higher than this variable. That means the other variable is more spread or more dispersed from the mean value. Is it clear? So that's a, that's a standard deviation. Now, can anyone give me an example, like what's the use of this measure, this statistical measure, standard deviation? Any example where you can use this number for uh, a particular decision making or uh, taking a decision? Any example? Standard deviation how dispersed the data is, or how spread the data is from its mean value. More dispersed, less dispersed, more spread, less spread. Any use? Any example? Real estate? Hmm? Real estate? Real estate? Can you explain a little? What do you want to say? Hmm? Housing prices, okay. Mm -hmm. So, like, how will you use that? Okay, let's say you have house prices and you have a standard deviation of house prices. So, how do you use that? Huh? Anybody else? Any idea? Standard deviation. Hmm? 
Do any one of you have investment in stock market? Hmm? No one? Stock market? Okay. Uh, uh, yes, you want to say anything? Yeah. Uh, I think usually it's just compare with the central the data. Okay, comparing individual observation with the center, we calculate standard deviation. I'm just asking you that, like in our practical life or in our day-to-day -day life, can you give any example where this, like a standard deviation type of information can be helpful? That's, that's what I'm asking. Okay, so by this time you understand that standard deviation tells you about the dispersion of data. Okay, now uh, I, I'm a finance student, that's why I like to give finance example. If you want to invest in a in a particular stock, particular share, you know that share price varies every day. You might have seen in the newspaper or in the television, they say that each day the share price fluctuates. Hmm? Now, if you have two stocks under consideration, let's say Commonwealth Bank share and BHP shares, and two stock has two different standard deviation. One has a standard deviation of five, another has a standard deviation of 10. Okay, that means last one year price was taken and a standard deviation was calculated. Commonwealth Bank has a standard deviation, a standard deviation of five, and DHP share has a standard deviation of 10. Which stock will you invest? Uh, Commonwealth, hmm? Commonwealth, Commonwealth Bank. Why? It's more stable, and the, the standard of deviation is to measure of the implication, implication of the, the, the price of the stock. Okay, so you want to say that Commonwealth Bank share price is more stable. Right. That's a very good point. So, look, you have two stock price and two standard deviation. When once the standard deviation is higher, it means that it's more fluctuating because as I already have said, the standard deviation shows you how dispersed the data is from the center. So when you have two standard deviation and one standard deviation is higher, one stock's standard deviation is higher compared to other, it means that the stock with the higher standard deviation has more fluctuating price and the stock with the lower standard deviation has a more stable price. Do you understand this point? Okay, so why do you like a more stable price? Because uh, firstly, you have to accept the accepted of the return of the stock. Mm -hmm. so standard deviation is uh, higher than the, your expected return. So this means that inflation is um, higher than the, your thought. So it's more stable. This means that, that the expected return is uh, uh, more uh, possible to be achieved. So this means uh, it's more stable. It means. Can you tell me in a simple language? Yeah. You know, that just means because that it's not make my, it simple. It is not my problem. They sort to say more stable is more easy to achieve your expected return. More stable is less risky. Why don't you say this? More stable means the stock price is less fluctuating. More stable, it means it's less risky. Right. Okay? And higher standard deviation means it's more fluctuating, so it is more risky. Okay? So yeah, that's, that's one use of standard deviation. Uh, normal distribution. This is another characteristics of data. Okay, so don't forget that we are we are talking about uh, the way of presenting or summarizing data. We talked about uh, the central tendency, measures of central tendency, measure of dispersion. Now, normal distribution. This is also a characteristics of data. So, normal distribution is a theoretical or symmetrical distribution. And it has a bell-shaped curve indicated by indicated by bell shape. For example, sorry, 
This is a normal distribution I think most of you are familiar with. So normal distribution is a theoretical distribution of a delta set. And <coughs> once again, when we have a delta set, we are interested to know that whether our data set is normally distributed or not. Why? Because a normally distributed data has certain characteristics. So if we can identify that our data set is normally distributed, we will know that our data set has these characteristics. If we find that no, our data set is not normally distributed, then we will understand that our data set deviates from these characteristics. So what are these characteristics, first of all? I have said that normally, uh, normally distributed data uh, is shown by a bell-shaped symmetric curve. So if you look at this, this is how, this is how a normally distributed data, like if you, if you prepare a probability distribution of a data set, if it is normally distributed, then it will look like this, okay? So what are the characteristics? You can see this, it's a bell-shaped, okay? The midpoint of the data is the mean. You can see here, 100. This is the mean of the data, okay? And it's bell-shaped, and it's called symmetrical. Okay, normally distributed data is called symmetrical. Symmetrical means half of the data, half of the data will be the right-hand side of the mean, and half of the data will be left-hand side of the mean, okay? Uh, this example is basically for an IQ test scores, okay? IQ test scores, where the scores ranges between 55 to 145. The mean score of this test was 100, okay? Mean score was 100, lowest score was 55, highest score was 155. So as it was, the probability distribution was drawn, it looks like this. So mean value 100, and as I already have said that this is the characteristics of the normally distributed curve, that half of the data will be right-hand side of the distribution. So if you just divide this distribution half, then half of the data will be the right of the mean, that is 100, and left of the, left of the uh, data will be the half. Half of the data will be in the left-hand side. This is another characteristic. And uh, another characteristic of normal distribution is when you have a normally distributed data, then one standard deviation, one plus minus standard deviation from the mean value will cover around 68% of the data. Two plus minus standard deviation from the mean will cover around 95% of the data. And three plus minus standard deviation from the mean we cover 99% of the data, okay? Uh, probably this point is not clear. So look at this. What I'm trying to say is if you have a normally distributed data set, then one plus minus standard deviation. The example that I was showing you, it has a mean value, it has a mean value of 100 and standard deviation of 50, okay? Mean value of 100 and standard deviation of 50. What I'm saying is, if the data is normally distributed, then plus minus one standard deviation from the mean value will cover 68% of the data. What, what does it mean? Look, 100 is our mean, right? If we add 15, what we get? 115, right? If we deduct 15, what we get? If we deduct 15, we get 85, am I right? 85. So, when you have a mean of 100 and a standard deviation of 15, plus minus one standard deviation gives you a range. What is the range? 85 to 115. So what I'm saying is, plus minus one standard deviation will cover 68% of the data. It means that, you can remember in this data set, 
this is the I, uh, it is the IQ test score. The minimum score was how much was? Minimum score was 55 and maximum score was 145. Now we get a range 85 to 115. What do we know? 68% of our data will be in this range, 85 to 115. Now, if we add, if we plus minus two standard deviation, so with 100, if we add two standard deviation, that means 215. So it will be 130. Am I right? 130. And if we deduct two standard deviation, it will be 70. So 70 to 130. This is two plus minus standard deviation. So I'm saying that plus minus two standard deviation from the mean will cover 95% of the data. So although the lowest and highest value was 55 to 145, but 70 to 130 will cover 95% of the data. Do you understand my point? That means you are reducing the range. So 95% of your data covers 70 to 130. Hmm? And plus minus three standard deviation, that means if you add three standard deviation and deduct three standard deviation, then you can cover 99% uh, of your data. That's the characteristics of normal distribution. Do you understand my point? So look what I'm trying to say. Particularly in this example, minimum value was 55, maximum value was 145. Okay. Now, if you exclude, try to understand, if you exclude all your data below 70 and exclude all your data higher than 130, how much of your data you will lose? Hmm? 5%, good. As I said that, this is 70 to 130, that is plus minus 2 standard deviation, and that covers 95% of your data. So if you exclude some of your outliers, outliers means some extreme observation, you do not consider any number below 70, and you do not consider any number higher than 130. So you exclude all of them. You lose only 5% of your data. It's still 95% of your data can be done. So sometimes when we do our research, we try to get rid of the extreme values, okay? Extreme values, and if it is normally distributed, then it's far easier for us because we know that if we add or deduct a certain standard deviation, we can cover this much of the data. So this is a characteristics of normal distribution. I just summarize: normally distributed data or normal distribution is a theoretical bell-shaped curve. It is symmetrical. It's uh, so symmetrical. Symmetrical means its center of the data will be the mean, and half of the data will be the right hand side of the mean, and half of the data will be in the left hand side of the mean. This is one characteristic, and the other characteristic is plus minus one standard deviation from the mean value will cover 68%. Plus minus two standard deviation from the mean value will cover 95% of the data, and plus minus three standard deviation from the mean value will cover 99% of the data. Once again, why this information is necessary? We will look at our data and we will try to fix or set that whether our data matches with the normal distribution or not. If it matches with the normal distribution, we will understand that our data set has these characteristics. Now, population distribution, sampling distribution, and population distribution, sample distribution, and sampling distribution. First of all, we already are clear about <coughs> the probability distribution. We just saw a normal distribution, or we already know how we can, how we can create a probability distribution. So population distribution and sample distributions are easy to understand. Why? Because if you have a population and you create if you have a population and you create a probability distribution for your population, then it will be population distribution. If you have a sample and you 
prepare a probability distribution for your sample that is sample distribution. That's everybody understand. But what is sampling distribution? Keep it in mind that theoretically, the sampling distribution will never be calculated. Okay? <coughs> sampling distribution will never be calculated. That's why particularly we, the business researcher, we have difficulties understanding the sampling distribution. Those are actually uh, found out or calculated by the statistician. Okay? So theoretically try to understand what sampling distribution is. <laughs> Let's say that you have a population. Okay? You have a population. If you prepare a distribution, that will be population distribution. From your population, you draw a sample and prepare a probability distribution for the sample that is sample distribution. Now the point is, if you have a population, it is possible to theoretically draw different samples from your population. Yes or no? For example, if you have 10 observations, 10 observations in your population, you have 10 observations. And you will draw a sample of three observations. OK? Try to understand my point. You have a population of 10 observations, and you want to draw a sample of three observations. Now, is it like, can you draw only one sample, or you can draw numerous samples? You can draw numerous samples. Yes or no? Like, you can draw 1, 2, 3, 2, 3, 4, 4, 5, 6, 5, 6, 7, 7, 8, 9. A lot of combinations possible. OK? So, as I am saying that sampling distribution is a theoretical distribution, so what I want to mean is if you have a population and if you draw numerous possible samples from your population and calculate the mean value for each of these possible samples, okay, calculate the mean of this each possible sample and draw a, uh, draw a probability distribution for mean of these possible samples, then it is called sampling distribution. Again I said, try to understand carefully. We have a population, if we draw different possible samples, okay? Now each possible sample, for each possible sample we can have, we can calculate a mean value. Yes or no? So we draw numerous possible samples, and for each possible sample we calculate a mean value, and we draw a probability distribution for all these mean values. So that, then it will be a sampling distribution. Is it okay? Is it clear or not? If it is not clear, let's see an example, <coughs> then I will come back to this point again. Look at this example. We have six employees. Donna, Heidi, Jason, Jennifer, Mark, and Eddie. And they are quality control experts. They are actually looking for defects in our products. Now, how many defects each of them found? Like Donna found one, Heidi got two, Jason got three, Jennifer got four, Mark got five, and Eddie got six. So if we sum up them, we get 21. Number of observation is 6. If we divide 21 by 6, we get 3.5. Okay? So that is our population. And what is our population mean? 3.5. Okay? That's our population means 3.5. Now, as I already have said, if we draw a probability distribution for this population, that will be our population distribution. Now, we will draw a sample from this population. And each sample will consist of two observations. Okay? Each sample will consist of two observations. Look at this. Now, don't forget what are the what are the observations we have. One, two, three, four, five, six. That's our population. Now we want to draw a sample of two observations. So how many possible samples are there? Look. 
It's possible that we take 1, 2, 1, 3, 1, 4, 1, 5, 1, 6, 2, 3, 2, 4, 2, 5, 2, 6, 3, 4, 3, 5, 3, 6, 4, 5, 4, 6, 5, 6. Okay? That means from the six observations, if you want to draw a sample that consists of only two observations, you can pick up 15 alternative samples. Yes or no? You can pick up 15 alternative samples. And also, you can calculate mean for each of these samples. For example, if you take sample 1, you have two observations, 1 and 2, right? So what's the mean value of this, 1.5? And what is the second sample, 1, 1 and 3? What's the mean of this sample, 2? So you can calculate mean of each of these possible samples, right? <coughs> now, if you draw a probability distribution for all the means of these possible samples, that means as you take the mean values 1.52, 2.53, 3.5, 3 all these means, if you draw a probability distribution of all these sample means, then it will be a sampling distribution. Is it okay? So we are here. Population distribution sample, distribution sampling, distribution sampling, distribution is the one that we just discussed. Now, look what we have at the bottom of the slide, standard error of the mean. That's the most important point we want to discuss in this slide. That's why we have discussed so far this population sample and sampling distribution. Look, standard error of mean. The standard error of mean is basically the standard deviation of sampling distribution that we have just seen. We have 15 possible samples, we calculate mean, draw a probability distribution for all these possible sample means, that's our sampling distribution. Now, standard error of mean, that is standard deviation of the sampling distribution. That means, if you have a sampling distribution and standard deviation is the standard error, so if you have a sampling distribution, it has a higher standard deviation, it means you have a higher standard error. And if you have a sampling distribution, it has a low standard deviation, it means that you have a low standard error. Okay. Now, what do you mean by this standard error? That's a question. Look, when we are talking about population sample, what we actually want to do is, we want to make an inference about our population from our sample, right? Okay. Now, if I go back to our example again, look, in this example, what is our population mean? Can you, can you check? What's our population mean that we have calculated? Population mean is 3.5. Okay, good. Population mean is 3.5. Now, keep it in mind, theoretically, Theoretically, we don't know what is our population mean. Yes or no? Like when we go for sampling, we take a sample, do we know what is our population mean? We do not know. So what we try to do, we go for a sample and we try to take sample mean or sample values to represent our population. Yes or no? Now the question is how closely or how truthfully our sample parameter will represent our population parameter. So if we have a theoretical sampling distribution, theoretical sampling distribution, and it has a low standard deviation, it means that for alternative possible samples, you have a very low dispersion, you have a very low standard deviation, it, it means that your sample mean is closer to your population mean. So you have a low degree of error. However, if you have alternative samples and you draw a sampling distribution and it has a very high standard deviation, so it means that it's possible, look, if you have a very high standard deviation, it means that your, samp your sample could be here or your sample could be here, but your population mean can be anywhere in between. So there is a chance that your sample mean deviates away from your population mean. 
So higher the standard deviation of your sampling distribution, it means that your sample means are spread in a larger range. So you have a higher standard error. It means that there is a high chance or high probability that your sample sample values will not very well represent your population values. Is this point clear? For example, in this case, our population mean is 3.5. And look, all of these are sample mean. 1.5, 2, 2.5, 3, 3.5. OK. So 3.5 was our population mean. And all these are sample means, I mean sampling distribution. So as we look at standard deviation of this sampling distribution, we can say that how good this sampling distribution is in representing our population mean. OK? So to summarize, once again, if you have a standard deviation of your population distribution, that means this one, standard error of mean. If you, have, if you calculate a standard error of mean for two variables or two data set, and one data set has higher standard error of mean, it indicates that for this data set, sample value does not well represent the population value. And on, for the other data set, if this standard error of mean is lower, it indicates that its sample values will be closer to your population values. Because this standard error of mean indicates how close your sample values to your population values. Is my point clear? So these are the notations we use to indicate population distribution, sample distribution, and sampling distribution. You will find them in, in your textbook. So just uh, we are carrying on discussing our population distribution, sample, and sampling distribution. So look, at the top of this slide, what you have is your population distribution. So that's your entire population. Now, as just few moments back, I showed you that from your population, it's not necessary that you pick up only one sample. It's from your population, it's possible that you pick up different alternative samples. So in the middle of the slide, you have three alternative samples, OK? Uh, and for each of these three samples, you calculate three means. Uh, look, mean, uh, this is x1, x2, and xn. So you have alternative samples and alternative means. If you create a probability distribution including all these means, then at the bottom of the slide, what you get is the sampling distribution. That means it's a probability distribution of your all possible sample means. Okay. So one information here is, as your sample size gets larger, your sampling distribution will approach to normality. Okay. That that's what we know as central limit theorem. That means, as I was saying that if you have a population and you draw alternative samples from your population, now it's possible that you have different sample sizes. For example, the one that I showed, we have six observations in our population, and we are picking up samples with two observations only. Now, it's possible that we pick up sample with two observation, three observation, four observation. Now, larger our sample size, so we have different samples and we create a sampling distribution. Larger the sample size, our sampling distribution will be closer to normal distribution. So that's, that's a theory. Look at this example. So you have four different populations okay, at the top of the slide. You can see uh, this is population, population, population. So you have four different population. And then you have sampling distribution. So once again, what is sampling distribution? From the population at the, at the top, you are picking up different alternative samples, calculating mean values, and creating a distribution. So that is your sampling distribution. Look, when your n equals to 2, n equals to 2 means sample size 2. You have, uh, these are your sampling distribution when your sample size is 2. Okay? Then, when your sample size is 
five, I mean n equals to five, then these are your sampling distribution. That means your sample size gets larger, so this is your sampling distribution. And when your sample size is 30, n equals to 30, then these are your sampling distribution, okay? So these are population distribution. This is your sample distrib sampling distribution when your sample size is two. This is your sampling distribution when sample size is five. And this is your sampling distribution when sample size is 30. So what, what do you understand from this example? Two, five, 30. You can see the shape of the, your sampling distribution is changing as the sample size is getting larger. Hmm? It is changing and finally, these are your sampling distribution. So as the sample size is getting larger, so your sampling distribution is getting a shape that is more closer to normal distribution. Can you remember the normal distribution, this bell-shaped curve? You can see earlier, earlier the shape was like different, different from the normal distribution. But as it gets five, it, it's become closer and it gets 30, it becomes closer to normal distribution. So that's what I'm trying to say, that as your sample size getting larger and larger, large sample size you can take, uh, your sampling distribution will have more closely represent your normal distribution. That means it gets more characteristics of normal distribution as you get, uh, as your sample size is larger and larger. This example we already discussed. Now, estimation of parameters and confidence intervals. First of all, let's start with an example. Let's say you are, you are doing a test market. Test market means you are trying to introduce a product. So you are testing your market that the product will have a viable, commercially viable market or not. So it's a, it's a new low-fat chocolate. What you have done is you have distributed this new low-fat chocolate to 500 households. Okay? Distributed new low-fat chocolate to 500 households. And after two weeks, <laughs> you call them and ask them that whether they will like to buy this chocolate anymore or not. Okay? 500 households. So among this 500, 400 reply that they will buy the chocolate again. Okay? So what does it mean? Among four, four, 500, 400 replies positively. So 400 among 500, what's the proportion? 80%. Am I right? So. 80% of your respondents say that they will buy the chocolate again. Okay? So, are you happy with this result? It's a test market. And on the basis of this test market result, you will either go for the production of this chocolate or you will just scrap this plan. So, 80% of your respondents say that they will buy the chocolate again. Are you happy with this test market? Will you go for it or you won't? I mean, you will introduce this product in the market or you won't? Are the, like, the test market, is it all the same value? So is it like, you know, how much are they buying? You know, is it a small shop, massive shop? Is it okay, we, we do not go to this complexity. We are just saying that, okay, 80% of our respondents will buy. So should we go or we do not? Okay, okay, anybody else? Okay, look what the point is. We have 500 respondents, and among these 500, 400 is saying that they will buy it, that's fine. So we won't do that 80% will buy. Now, we go for production. So do we produce for these 500 people, or we produce for the population. I mean, we produce it for the whole population. We produce it for the whole population, am I right? Hmm? Okay. Now, the question is, the 80% people want to buy. 
how good this result is in terms of our population. Because 80% wants to buy 80% of what? 80% of our sample. Isn't it? So it does not necessarily mean that 80% of our population will buy. So what's the question? Question is how accurate this measure is or how good this measure is or how good this sample measure to represent our population measure. Hmm? These are the questions. Now, as I was saying at the start of this class that in business research, we typically do inferential statistics. Inferential statistics means we go for a sample, as I was saying, 500 people, we get response from 400, and we take it as a response for our entire population. Okay? Now, this inference can be drawn based on these two. One is either point estimates or confidence interval estimates. What does it mean? If we go for point estimates, carefully listen, if we go for point estimates, then our sample values are taken as the best estimate of our population values. Again I say, sample estimates are taken as the best estimate of our population. What does it mean? It means that if we go for point estimate, then what we get from our sample? That 80% people will buy. We will take that 80% people, 80% 80 of our population will buy it, so we will go for it. That means if in point estimate, a single measure, the typically the sample values will be taken as the values of population. Okay? Now, so what does it mean? It means that sample mean will be taken as population mean. Sample standard deviation will be taken as population standard deviation. So sample values will represent the population. Now you understand it is very risky, isn't it? Hmm? Yes or no? For example, what we are saying that sample mean will be equal to population mean. Now, if we are extremely lucky, then it will be true. Otherwise not. Yes or no? If you have like a population of 100,000, and if you have a sample of 1,000, then it's very, very unlikely that your sample mean and your population mean will be same. Okay? So point estimates, if you go for point estimates, you take the sample measures as the population measure, then it's very risky and there's a high chance of error. Yes or no? That's why we go for confidence interval estimates. I'm telling you theoretically, previously we used to do this mathematically, but uh, nowadays we do not need to do this mathematically because computer software does them, okay? So we go for confidence interval estimate. So what is confidence interval estimate? <coughs> Sorry. Instead of going point estimates, when we go for confidence interval estimates, rather than, carefully listen again, rather than taking a single sample value to represent our population value, we take the sample value, we take the sample value, and we make a plus minus sampling error to get a range. And we assume that our population values will lie within that range. Do you understand my point? For example, let's say our sample mean is 5. So if we go for point estimates, our sample mean is 5, we will take that our population mean is also 5. That is the point estimates. Okay? Now, as I already have said that it's pretty much risky that our sample mean and population mean will be exactly the same. So instead of point estimates, if we go confidence interval estimate, what we do? We actually create a range. Okay? We create a range. So what's a range? We create a range and we assume that or we estimate that 
our population value will lie within this range. In this case, our sample mean is 5, okay? Let's say we have 5% sampling error. 5% sampling error. So what we will do is, this 5 is our sampling mean, uh, sample mean. So we will plus minus this sampling error, okay? So it is plus 5 plus point zero 0.05. So how much is it? 5.05. Am I right? And if we deduct this point zero 0.05, it will be 4.95. Yes or no? So what range we get? We get 4.95 to 5.05. Okay. So that's the difference between that's the difference between point estimates and confidence interval estimate. If we go for point estimate, uh, if our sample mean is 5, we will say that our population mean is also 5. But if we go for confidence interval estimate, our sample mean is 5, we will find out what is our sampling error. Let's say this is 5%. So we will add and deduct this 5% from our sample mean, and we will create a range. For example, in this case, we get a range of 4.95 to 5.05. So now we will say, well, our sample mean is 5, but our confidence interval estimate is 4.95 to 5.05. So it is most likely that our population mean will lie between this range. Okay, so you understand it's a safer option. This confidence interval estimates is a safer option compared to point estimates because we are not we are not on taking a decision on the basis of only one value. Rather, we are making or we are creating a range, and we are saying that our population value will will be within this range. Is it okay? concept we need to know is confidence level. We will also see these in our workshop session that how we incorporate this confidence level in our uh, statistical decision making. Confidence level, don't be confused with the confidence level with the one that we just discussed as a confidence interval estimate. That's a, that's a, different, con uh, that's a different concept where we make a range. Confidence level is a, is a particular value. It's generally a decimal value, okay? That actually shows that how confident the researcher is about the statistical decision or about the statistical inference. Again, I said, confidence level, like when you say that we are 95% confident or 90% confident or 99% confident, we use it in this way. So it's typically a, it's a, it's a decimal value that shows how confident a researcher is regarding the accuracy of the statistical inference. Okay? So the crux of this problem is the researcher need to decide what will be this confidence level. Like it, typically we take it as 99%, 95%, Ninety percent, not below that. Okay, so when we say that ninety-five percent confidence level, ninety-five percent confidence level, it means that researcher is accommodating five percent chances of error. Hmm? Five percent chances of error. What does it mean? Look, uh, let's say that we have. 50 students here, we calculate an average marks. Average marks. Say that average of average score of this 50 student is 60. Average score is 60. Now, what we are checking is, let's say we, we develop a hypothesis that the average of we, we calculate the average and we have an expected average for example so expected average is say 65 
and our calculated average is 60. <coughs> okay. So we have a hypothesis that expected average and calculated average are same. Okay? Calculated average are same. So expected average and calculated average is same. That's our null hypothesis. If we run some statistical test and we accept or reject our hypothesis at 95% confidence level, it means that the researcher is 95% confident that these two are same or these two are different. If I take another example, let's say that we have some male students here and female students. We hypothesize that average score of male and average score of females are same. Okay, again I said, we hypothesize that average score of male and average score of females are same. And we make some statistical test. So you will later learn how we do this statistical test. We make some statistical test and we find that this hypothesis is true. Okay, this hypothesis is true. That means average score of male and average score of female are same. So, when the researcher is 95% confident, it means that researcher is agreeing, is agreeing that average score of male and average score of female is same 95 times out of every 100 times. Okay? So, it doesn't mean that average score of male and average score of female same. It doesn't mean that all the time, for all the subsamples, for all the sub 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 uh, circumstances, average score of male and female will be same. So when you accept or reject your hypothesis at 95% confidence level, it means that you have a 5% tolerance level. So you have 5% tolerance to your error. It means that researcher draws an inference but he knows that this inference can be wrong. How far? Five times out of every hundred times. If it is, if the researcher is ninety percent confident, ninety-four, ninety percent confident, it means that the statistical inference is true ninety out of every hundred times, or the statistical inference is false, or it's wrong ten out of every hundred times. So that is the confidence level. Okay, we will see uh, that when we run our statistical test in Excel, by default, if we do not change it, by default, Excel takes 95% confidence level. Okay, so 95% uh, confidence level means it's accommodating 5% level of error. So when we run any statistical test with 95% confidence level, we are actually accepting 5% chances of error. And once again, why the error arises? Don't forget. The error arises because we are analyzing sample and we are making a decision on the basis of sample about our population. That's why the error arises. Do you get my point? So uh, this point I already discussed that the random error that I, we were talking about that since we are taking sample, we are not taking our population, and sample's decision is generalized for the population, so there uh, arises an error that's called random error. But there is an inverse relationship between random error and sample size. We, we discussed this point earlier. There is an inverse relationship between random error and sample size. What does it mean? It means that larger your sample size, that means if as you can make your sample large and large and large. You can deduce your random error. You understand that? You understand the logic behind it, as I am saying. That why this random error arises? Because we are taking a sample that's only a part of the population. Now, as your sample gets larger, what does it mean? Sample gets larger means it getting closer, closer, and closer to the population. That's why your sample I uh, mean, random sampling error will be reduced. So that's that's actually shown with this diagram. You can see, 
In the vertical axis, it shows random sampling error, and in the horizontal axis, it shows the sample size. So, larger the sample size, that means as the sample size increases, you can reduce your sampling error. So, uh, like to reduce this sampling error, we will always try to have a reasonably large sample size. Factors of concern in choosing a sample size. That means if we, if we want to choose a sample size, we need to look at these factors. First of all is variance or heterogeneity. We need to look at the variance or heterogeneity of our sample. If, of, if, uh, of our population, I'm sorry. If our population is homogeneous, uh, or the population doesn't have very high variance, then we can afford to take a relatively smaller sample. Whereas if our sample has a very high variance, sorry, if our population has a very high variance and heterogeneous, then we have to take a large sample. Once again, if our population is homogeneous, our variance is very low, then we can take a small sample. But if our population is heterogeneous, our variance is very high, then we should take a large sample. I, I give you two examples, and I will ask you that in, in which case you will take a large sample, and in which case you will take a small sample. First of all, you, will, you need to find out average age of class 11 students. This is the first one. You need to get average age of class 11 students. Okay. Second, second one is, you need to get average age of Jew visitors. Average age of Jew visitors. Now can you tell me in which case you will take a large sample and in which case you will take a small sample? Class 11 students, Jew visitors. In both cases you will calculate average age. Okay. Because the class normally requires a quite homogeneous age group. Mm -hmm. The second one and the larger. Okay, good. So for class 11 student, we are put to take a small sample. Why? Because since you are taking average age of class 11 students, it's very likely that they are not very heterogeneous. Like the variance of age of class 11 students will not be very high. They are very homogeneous. But if you take Jew visitors, then their age, the variance of their age will vary like maybe newborn to very old age. That's why the variance will be high. They are very heterogeneous. That's why we will have to take a large sample. Okay? That's, that's the point I want to say, that if our population is homogeneous, it's, it's, uh, it's okay if we get a relatively small sample. An opposite is true when we have a very heterogeneous population. The second one is magnitude of error. That means how precise your estimate be. How precise your estimate has to be. Look, a few moments back I, I talked about confidence interval estimates. And as we have said that when we go for confidence interval estimates, what we actually do is we create a range on the basis of the sample value and plus minus some sampling error, and we create a range. Okay? Now, you understand that if this range is too large and if this range is too small, that will actually affect how precise your estimate is. Yes or no? Like if this, if this range is very large, so you have high degree of precision, or you have low degree of precision. Did you get my question? You have confidence interval estimate, your sample value, then you plus minus some sampling error, so you get a range. Now, if you if you have a large range, or if you have a smaller range, that actually tells you how precise your estimate is. You understand that if you have a large range, less precise your estimate. Yes or no? 
Because if you have a large range, your population value can, can anywhere within this large range, so less precise your estimating. On the other hand, if you have a small range, it means that more precise your estimate is. Isn't it? Okay. Now, if you want to have a more precise estimate, that means a smaller range of confidence interval estimate, then you need to go for a large sample size. Because if you have a large sample size, if you have a large sample size, your sampling error will be smaller. As a result, you get a smaller confidence interval estimate range. But if your sample size is smaller, you will have large sampling error. As a result, your confidence interval estimate range will also be large. So your uh, in, uh, degree of precision will also be low. And then confidence level. I, I just said a few moments back that confidence level indicates how confident a researcher is about the accuracy of the statistical decision. Like when you say that this hypothesis is accepted or this hypothesis is rejected, how confident the researcher is. And as I said that typically we use three different level of confidence. One is 99% confident, 95% confidence level, or 90% confidence level. So higher the confidence level the researcher wants to be, that means higher the confidence researcher want to have, lower will be the tolerance to the error. So higher has to be the sample size. Again, I said, higher the level of confidence a researcher wants to have about the accuracy of the result, lower the level of tolerance to the error, so higher should be the sample size. On the other hand, lower the level of confidence the researcher has, higher is the tolerance to the error, is smaller can be sample size. Is this point here? Again, I said, if your sample size is larger, researcher can be confident. So has less tolerance to error. Okay. On the other hand, if your sample size is smaller, definitely your degree of tolerance has to be tolerance to error has to be higher and researcher will become less confident. So that's the end of our lecture session today. And as we discuss some terminologies, sample, sample sampling and population statistics, measures of center tendency and this partial confidence interval estimates. So if I just say few sentences to relate this discussion with, with your assessment. As I already had mentioned uh, yesterday's class, and also I just combined these two uh, sessions today, that in your assessment, you have one section that is sample sampling design. So in that, in that section, what I will expect that first of all, you write what is your target population, as we mentioned in the last class. What is your target population? And then what is the sam sampling technique you follow? For example, a simple random sampling, or stratified sampling, or quota sampling, or whatever. What sampling technique you follow? How you will implement this sampling technique? Hmm? How will you implement this sampling technique? Then you need to clearly write down your sample size. Okay, sample size. Okay. Keep in mind that what I will be more interested in that how you defend your sample size. That means if you say, okay, this is my population, this is the sampling technique I will follow, and this is the sample size. Clearly write down your sample size, like 500, 1,000, 5,000, whatever. Try to clearly write down what is your sample size, okay? And how did you get this number? That means if you say that your sample size is 100 or 500 or 600 or 1,000, how did you come up this number? Okay, that means what's the basis of this number? Keep it in mind, these are, the, these are the questions you need to answer even if like you conduct a research professionally for the other organizations and you say that we will do a survey of uh, 500 people, your, your client will ask you why 500, why not 100 or why not uh, 300 or so, okay? 
So uh, in our late, in our workshop session, I will show you some some extracts and some examples from your textbook that will help you to put some references or to put some justification that why did you use this particular sample size? Okay. I didn't show you here any formula or any calculation, but in your textbook, in this chapter, you will find some equations, some tables, okay? I didn't show them because none of these procedures are very much like universally accepted, okay? I, but I will show them in the workshop session, and you can use any of them to justify your number, but you must justify that why your sample size is, say, 500 or 100, not the others. Okay? So for everything, target population, clearly write down your target population. Sampling technique, justify why this sampling technique. Why random sample, or why stratified sample, or why quota sample, why? Sample size, justify why this sample size. Put some justification in terms probably some citation of the previous articles, or even some tables or some references from your textbook. Okay? So see you after five minutes. Yes, sir. 